Private Peaceful yeah. is a particularly moving novel, one of the few books to have blinded me with tears, I think, the end of that book. It was um, that bad, was it? <laughs> You're speaking as an editor, my goodness, this book, you should never have written it. No, I think it's, I think it's an extraordinary book. I think it's your, your masterpiece. Um, but what, what inspired you to write that one? Um, that, again, was um, a truth, a happening. It's always a happening. In this case, I was invited to uh, Ypres in Belgium, which is very important in, in, because it was a, there was a huge battle around this little town in Belgium, in um, which many, many people on both sides died. And it was a place that the British had to defend, and the Belgians and the French, because if the Germans had broken through there, they could have um, come to the Channel ports, and it would have been very serious. So they had to hold that particular city. And there's a museum there now called In Flanders Field. And I went there with a good friend of mine, Michael Foreman, who has illustrated many of my, uh, my stories, particularly my stories about war. Because there was a conference about writing about war for young people in this extraordinary museum. And uh, I remember walking through it and coming out the other end of it. And Michael had gone on ahead of me. And I was in tears because it was it's the most powerful evocation of the suffering of war on all sides. That's what the museums do. You find out as much about the Germans and the Belgians and people from New Zealand and India and Africa, all these people who came to take part in this world war. The, it, it's all there, the whole thing. And it's painful. And I was just about to leave and I came across this letter in a frame and read it. It was just a typed letter which said, we regret to inform you that your son, Private So-and-so, was shot at dawn for cowardice on such and such a day, 1916, and it was signed by a lieutenant. And there was a little envelope above it, and the envelope was addressed to, I think it was a mother in, somewhere in Salford, Manchester. And you could see where it had been opened, because the envelope was flattened out. And you could see the rip. Mm. And you knew that what opening that envelope, what that mother must have dreaded, that. This is how you receive news of your son's death. So she'd have dreaded it anyway. So she opens it and she finds out that he'd been shot at dawn for cowardice, which is, at the time, unbelievably shameful. So that family's life would have been mm. wrecked forever. And then I asked the man who ran the museum, how common was that? And he said, well, over 300 are British and Allied soldiers were shot for cowardice or desertion. Two of them were shot because they fell asleep on sentry duty. And then he showed me some of the trials of these people, and you realize that there was very little justice. This was all to do with setting an example. Um, so there are, in proportion, there were far too many Irish soldiers shot, and there was a good reason for that politically and far too many um, black soldiers were shot in proportion to the number that there were. So you knew something wasn't right. That there, When you read these trials, it was very evident they were just seeking an excuse to execute them, to make sure that other people didn't do the same thing. They didn't run away, they didn't disobey orders. And then you read accounts of what happened on the last night, and the fact that they were always alone, or usually alone, sometimes in some barn, sometimes in a prison cell. And then the cruelest thing of all, in a way, is that they very often made the people who were the friends of the man shoot him, so they'd be the firing squad. So I thought, well, this story needs telling. It's unbelievably cruel. I knew there was a whole movement of families of these people who were still trying to persuade the government even then, 20 years ago, that these men should be pardoned, that they had not had a fair mm -hmm. trial, and it had been refused, 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 refused. So anyway, I wrote this story, and I decided to tell it during the last night, just before an execution. And what you don't know in the book is um, whether the brother is the person who's going to be shot, um, or the one telling the story. You just don't know until the very last moment. Um, and every chapter is not a chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. It's it, it's the time mm. as the night goes through until dawn, and they were always shot at six o'clock in the morning. So yeah, it um, it was a painful book to write, 
Um, but I've never regretted it in the sense that it it provided, I think, um, yet another um, reason for the families to take heart that there were people out there who thought this was a, a cruel injustice. And um, I wrote to people as well. I wrote to Mrs. Blair. Um, other people were doing the same. And, but I think it was wonderful at a certain moment when the government did decide um, that these men should be pardoned, that the play of Private Peace for Laurent was on um, in Trafalgar Square, which was just along from the Houses of Parliament. And I rather liked that. So I hope it made its small contribution to righting a wrong that it could never take away the suffering of both the people concerned and their families, of course. And um, I know the, there's an origin there, which is very, very strange. I, I remember th going back to Ypres to go back to the museum later when I was writing the book, and I still hadn't found the name of my soldier. Um, I can't remember what I called him in the first draft. But um, we oh, went, you'd written a draft. Yes, with a, yeah, I yeah. never knew that. I written written a draft, and I, I really can't remember the name of it now. Anyway, Private Smith or something. <laughs> Private question mark. But what I did was to, by pure luck, I always make a point when I go back to Ypres of never just going in and going to a hotel and having a good meal. You need to almost remind yourself why you're there. And there are many, many, many cemeteries you can visit and indeed should visit. And I always go to one. And the one that we chose that day was on the road into Ypres, about three miles outside. There's a place called the Bedford Cemetery. And we parked the car, and Claire and I got out and just walked into the drizzle. It was very gloomy. And um, we weren't looking for names at all. And she stopped and said, oh, look, I think this is, a, this is extraordinary. And there was this private peaceful written on this gravestone. And his date of uh, his age and date of death. And so I thought, well, that would be the most extraordinary name. Mm -hmm. So we went to the back to the museum afterwards and said, do we have any record? And is anyone interested in this particular soldier? And the manager of the museum said, not as far as we know. So I took the name and used him as my, the two brothers are called, peaceful. And then it was fine. Then at one point, the family, and there is a family, um, realized that the name had been spelt wrong. And I don't think even they asked for it to be put right, but the War Graves Commission decided that because there are so many people now who come to see that grave, mm -hmm. a lot of school parties go out there, um, having read Private Peaceful, which of course is not the grave of Private Peaceful, yes. it's simply the name. Yeah. It's a, in a way, what's wonderful is that they have a name of their unknown soldier. Yeah. And their unknown soldier has been real to them because of the book that they've read. So there's a mixture of fact and fiction. Mm. And so they come and they, it, it is, and they come and put wreaths there and they, put, they come and put letters. So I think people thought, well, actually, we've got to put this right. And so the other day I went out to Belgium, only about three or four uh, weeks ago, and they had made a new gravestone with two L's, which is his proper name. Peaceful. Peaceful, yes. And so I know what will happen now. The kids will come along and they'll look at it and say, Michael Morpurgo can't even spell. <laughs> so it'll rebound one way or the other. 